I got you in here finally. You did. Cool. <laughs> the gangster. <laughs> so that's the thing. Like you guys are, you guys are a couple of South Florida OGs, right? And when I say OG, I don't mean original gangster. I mean offshore godfathers, <laughs> right? And that's the truth. All right, so uh, I'm glad you're back. Yeah, thanks for having me back, right? man. You came back. Yeah, glad to be here. You came back. We have business. Yeah, to take care of. We, so we got business to take we have care business of. Business to take care of. Damn right That's we it. do. I like That's that it. ring. Thanks, man. Let me see that thing. There you go. Skull and waves, man. David Yerman. That's sweet. Yeah, I like it, man. It's kind of under sweet. I like it. Right on. So okay. listen. Welcome to Connected by Water, right? Presented by Joey Cardi, Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram, and fueled by Papa's PLR Room, right? I am here today. I'm your host, Dennis Friel, and I'm here today with, as I said, a couple of offshore godfathers, right? Welcome back to the show, Thanks. Tiny Walcott, and welcome to the show, Mr. Tim Maddock. Thank you for having me. Yes. So, um, what's up, man? Tell me a story. Man, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> no, this, so this, is, this is why I say that. This is why I say that, right? Because when I saw him at the Cove tournament, we're sitting on Nate's boat, and it was after your episode, right? He's like, man, me and Tiny go way back. You we don't do. even know how far back we go. I mean, way back. Call him right now. Call him right now, right? Yeah. So I'm we, like, all right. So tell do, me a man. story. We, we were just starting to talk about it. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a good story quickly about this guy. This guy, <laughs> very influential in my career. Very, very influential. Yeah. Um, one of the, he was the first guy that really had been in the, I met, uh, like that had been in the private boat world, had been like catching giant bluefin tunas and like trolling and kite fishing. And I mean, he's, I, whether you guys know it or not, this is like, this is definitely one of the Pompano gangsters. Oh, I know it from old G. Like when it comes to kite fishing, like his team and his gang <clears throat> definitely in the midst of making it what it is today. Like I credit him a lot for the kite game, you know, well, I credit Maybe you like, for bringing him into the room because this is episode 81. <laughs> and, and I think I've been asking him to come in since episode one. Yeah. Right, and he's finally here. Uh, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. I don't know. He, he's, he's I've a, been asking you for a while. He's a quiet, he's like, I'll cocky. Come in, I'll come in. Oh, not, not, not yet, though. Not yet, though. He's a quiet, cocky, understated yeah. guy. It's really unique. He, he's, a, he's a unique, dynamic kind of guy. He's a, a, a definitely a different dude. That's for sure. Different thinking. Yeah. And uh, no, he's cocky definitely. as hell if, if you let him be. But he's <laughs> one of the most humble people I ever met, for sure. Hey, Tim, you're definitely an interesting guy. They broke the mold, that's for sure. I Good or bad, indifferent, I good. guess. Good. Great. It's no, good. no, I no, great. Good. Good. Listen, listen, when we talk about the best of the best, and we do on this show all the time, and I like to think that I've brought the best of the best into this, there's still a few on my hit list that I still need to get in here, right? But I, I think we've got a lot of quality people that come on this show, right? For sure. And Tim, you're, you're above and beyond on that list. We've been doing it for a minute. Yeah. Long a little time. bit. I mean, a little bit. And I, we were talking about that, right? So I want to retell what I said at the bar, too, just for the sake of the show. First time we ever met, I was in high school, right. way back when, because, you know, friends with your sister and we all went to high school together. And I look up on the wall, and you correct me. It's blue fin tuna tail. It's this huge ass. Was it 800 pounds? 840. Right? Something, right? And I was like, oh, my God. I looked up at it, right? <laughs> and Danielle comes over. He goes, yeah, my brother <clears throat> caught that. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, who caught that? She's like, my brother caught that. And then you walked in the room. That was the first time I ever met Tim Maddox. So. Yeah, so first impressions are everything, right? I just so. had that tail redone at Gray. Yeah. When we had that big yellow fin that we caught last year. Yeah. And we had that, that mounted, and I had the tail redone, and mm -hmm. it just bringing back the memories of, you know, I was like 16 years old when, yeah, 17 years old when I was up, you know, when I was up there doing that. And yeah, didn't you have this, like this picture of you holding up this big curly hair or whatever? Yeah. I looked like Timmy then. Yeah, yeah. I look like yeah. Timmy. Yeah. 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 I want to take a time out here real quick and introduce our returning bartender. <laughs> Miss Carlene Robinski. Gentlemen. How are you? Fantastic. Thanks for coming back. Absolutely. We didn't run you off last time. Nope. Now you're going to talk more today. A little scared today. <laughs> the time in the room. So <laughs> Carlene's highlights include dyeing mustaches, right? And she did that last time, but there's no mustaches to be dyed today. So just fresh you, drinks. You, you and, got one. And what about back waxing? Do you do that? I actually have done that. <laughs> um, when you came in last time, you came in, you told a story, right? And it was 
obviously the most compelling of stories. And actually, I think there was like the biggest, most, that was probably the most popular episode that we, that we have had. Mm. Right. And cause everyone for weeks and weeks was, Oh my God, that story, that tiny story. Oh, that, that was insane. That was crazy. Was like people that, you know, don't normally watch my show that I told all oh, you got to watch this episode. They come back. Oh, that was great. That was great. Right. So, but you're coming on today, not to tell a story you're coming on with your pal. Yeah. Right, to talk yeah. about the old days. Old days. And you know, right. you know, I, I'm not going to let him get away with this, but he has a pretty amazing story of survival too, which mm -hmm. I hope you got, he touches on in this conversation yep. because it's a, it's a story when I heard um, what had happened to him, I wasn't shocked that he survived it. And uh, because he's just that dude, you know, he's yeah. that guy, that hardcore old school, tough, tough dude. Mm -hmm. I got a couple stories of toughness to tell about <laughs> him. Like I met, I met Timmy, on the Florida fish finder, which was a head boat, um, that fish to drive tortugas. Mm -hmm. So I was young at, I, I was 17 years old and, uh, just started my career. Just started like moved from the Helen S and the fish city pride to the fish finder kind of decided I wasn't going to college. And, uh, we did this trip. It was like a, it was like a, no, it was like, like a mutton trip. It was on the moon. Everything was planned out carefully. Like all the regulars came, uh, Timmy wasn't a regular at the time, but he showed up with first time ever, first time what? ever on a boat. And he showed up with cliff and I think Mike research and a couple other people, yeah. a couple of the Pompano gangsters, you know, sailfish gangsters. Yeah. Well, Mike's and not, Mike's kind of pretty, right? He, yeah. He, he's calm gangster. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. He's a real deal. He's good. There was a bunch of them that showed up. <laughs> we with showed up probably, yeah, that was a pile of us. I mean, they showed up with like more coolers than I had. I've been working on a boat for a while. They showed up with more coolers, all custom rods. I mean, ice bait, like these guys were like going at it, right? Like they were ready. Like, I'm like, whoa, look at this. Look at this bunch of dudes. I mean, full on. And uh, how old were you at the time? I was 17. 17. So yeah, I'm 40. I'll be 49 this year. So it was a long so, time yeah. ago that we met. And uh, I was 18 um, or 19. Yeah, he shows up. He's got like this custom etched window with like marlin and sailfish in his truck. And like, I mean, Chris Reeser. Yeah, these guys were like <laughs> hardcore, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this 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 is a cool looking gang, right? So I started kind of paying attention to these guys because they're just crushing fish. I mean, three days nonstop. I think I think his group caught just as much as everybody else on the boat, not counting the crew. And they're up in the bow, just destroying, right? And having a blast too. Nobody was <clears> drinking, <throat> nobody was doing anything other than just hardcore. I mean, they fished round the clock. And uh, you know, I started talking to Timmy and Cliffy. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, I've fished offshore and I've trolled and I've kite fish a lot. And, you know, I've caught bluefins. I'm like, man, it's really the first person that had that kind of experience. And from I knew custom rods. I knew what good looking fit, you know, what good fishermen look like. And I'm like, you know, I was just picking his brain for like three days. And I think on that Monday, uh, we, we exchanged phone numbers. And that Monday I was home. I drove back in QS. I was living in Fort Lauderdale all the time. And Timmy, Timmy called me up and he's like, hey, man, you think uh, you think I get a job on that boat? I'm like, dude, we're always looking for good crew. And keep in mind that the crew, there's some good crew that worked <coughs> on that boat, like Mario Fortier and Don Johns and a couple other. Matt Bear. Matt Bear Anton. and uh, George Beck. A lot of really pretty well-known fishermen today worked on that boat. Anton, a bunch of those guys. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, Timmy, come with me, man. I'd love to work with you, you know. So we went down to Davie and I introduced him to the owner of the boat and pretty much hired him on the spot. And Timmy and I worked together, I don't know, for probably a year. About a year on this boat. And I mean, we changed the dynamic on that boat totally because we went from running with four mates to like just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I was just like picking his brain about offshore. Cause I just really wanted to get in the game, you know? And, uh, man, he was not easy to work with. He was, he was like such a perfectionist. Like when it came to his knots, when it came to like sharpening hooks, we never sharpened hooks. We tied rigs for the customers. <laughs> He's out there with his file sharpening hooks. Like, no, dude. He's like, you don't understand. Like you take care of the customers, you, you get the tackle, right. They're going to catch more fish. They're going to give you more tips. Just simple, simple economics. Right. I'm like, man, this guy's really on it, you know? So, uh, unfortunately that came to an end. And I remember the day it did, he was, uh, he was like, he, he had so much energy back then. He'd just be running around the deck, gaffing fish and both as it picked up my energy. So I was like, man, I got to keep up with this guy. So we're both trying to outdo each other on tips and on customers and catching fish. And we're sleeping like two hours, fishing four and working 12, you know? And that was like Pretty around much. the clock. And Timmy was running, like this dude had this big Kingfish on up on the bow. And Timmy was running with the gaff, man. And then we had these metal benches. And man, he caught the corner of the bench. I think it was his left knee. Was your right, right kneecap? Caught it with his kneecap, man. Done. Really, and dude. Yeah. Broke it. Almost like, two pieces. Like his knee. I'm not <clears> kidding. <throat> the size of his table. 
And if I remember right, he still worked a couple shifts until it just blew up too much to where they were like, no, nah, no, nah, dude. I, we, I mean, I mean, he, it I knew bad. how tough he was after yeah, that yeah, year because was... I mean, we chopped fingers off. We'd done a bunch of crazy things. Yeah. And, and uh, I knew how tough he was at that point. And I knew, dude, he was in tears. Like, like, I'm like, man, this is serious. Like, I'm like almost the point, like, should we like airlift him out? Because it was just they blowing tried, up. His really. knee was that big. The Coast big. Guard wouldn't fly to the Ford. It was blowing too hard. Yeah. They were going to mm-hmm. fly a helicopter for um, Fort Jefferson. That bad. Yeah, yeah. but it was bad. too rough. And wow. we were on a three-day trip, and that was after the second day. We had to leave early. Yeah. You know, I had to get back. I mean, when, right. you know, it was. The, the thing was, I remember. Yeah, he, you, he, you don't want to mess with yeah, that, it was though. Crazy. I mean, yeah. It wasn't just swollen. It turned black. And I remember, right, like, that's what I mean. Like, like blood that, poisoning. Could, that could get bad. <laughs> it yeah. was like we were concerned about blood poisoning because mm-hmm. his knee was that black. I mean, it shattered his knee. Does that thing bug you from that? Does that ever bother you? They're both messed up. That's what happens when you get old, so. Yeah. Walk it off. <laughs> walk I don't it know if, if it's from that, but yeah, it's, it's, they, you know, whatever. But. So I want to rewind a little bit, right? I know we were talking about when you were 18, but I want to go back a little bit further than that, right? I want to get like a little bit underneath. Like, you, so you're born and bred Pompano Beach. Nope. No. No? Where New are you York. from? Are you from New York? Yep. And when did you start fishing up there and then come down here? Like, take me to the genesis of this thing. So my, I, w- I want to kind of understand the beast a little bit. My dad had a little boat up there, a little 18 foot Thunderbird tri hull. Mm-hmm. Um, same as my grandfather. They had the same boats. And, you know, every weekend, that's what you do. We'd, you know, take the boat out, go to the beach, go clamming, go bass fishing, go bluefish fishing, fluke fishing. And, um, you know, we did that since... You know, we got slides when we were that big, you know, mm-hmm. catching snapper blues off the dock and Portuguese and all the stuff that you do in New York, you know, never really much offshore. You know, the boat right. was not made for that. I right. mean, it was, you know. Plus you got to go so far out. Yeah. So it was there. all all inshore stuff, but we just, and, you know, again, just like here, whether you're bass fishing or goggle eye fishing, if they're biting, who cares? It's fun, mm-hmm. right? You know, you're doing what you yeah. love to do. So every weekend, that's just what we did. You know, we, we were on the water. So when we moved down here, my dad bought his first boat. And of course, you know, it's a different world. You know, you're, you're, you're not really doing an inshore thing here. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to learn, you know, learn to figure out the ocean. And, um, we did that for, he bought his first boat. I don't know how many years he had it for maybe five or six years he had a 23 foot formula Mm -hmm. and then he bought a 25 mako in 83 1983 so when did you really start feeling it like like because i mean the 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 passion and the drive for it and all you know what i mean like like, i'm sure like as a kid you know you fish you have fun and we've all been there i mean you know pure rats you know what i mean And, and stuff like that and then but then there's a certain point where like that light that switch goes off, you know what I mean? And you're like, all right, I'm serious about this. So people, I mean, I'm often asked, you know, who taught you the most in fishing or, you know, who do you look up to the most mm-hmm. or, you know, where, where'd you get it from? Where'd you get the, the go? And it's funny because I look at pictures fishing with my dad and we'd be fishing like a, you know, a billfish tournament with one kite out with two baits on it mm-hmm. and like two rods out the other side, number seven wire, J hooks this big, <laughs> you know, 80 pound mono, you yep. know, um, had no business being there. All that know. Andy mono filament. Well, just had no business being yeah. in the tournament, you know, the Fergus. So, so now you go back the Ferguson's, do you know who they, mm-hmm. Barbara Ferguson and Don, right? So there was three or four boats back then that were doing the live chum in fish and pilchards, which no one even yeah. knew nothing about offshore. Um, so again, being on my dad's boat, but being way too young, you know, you never went out and got 10 sailfish bites in a day, right? but they would catch three or four or five. And it was a lot of the tournaments were kill tournaments. So, you know, holy crap, they got five sailfish on the dock. Like that was like, for me, man, I just can't wait to catch one. You know, my Mm -hmm. first one, I want to catch my first one. And, um, so I, I think even at a young age, it was, it was there, it was there, the, you know, it was, it was inside of me. And then when my dad died, you know, his boat went away and, and, you know, that was that in 1987. That's when I went up North, mm-hmm. we b- buried my dad up in, in New York. And then I ended up fishing up there that season. Um, and I, and I said, I'm going to fish with 
everybody I can be, until I get my own boat and, and just learn and just learn and just learn. Um, you know, cause everybody's got their little, you know, everybody's got something to offer to this day. Every time I go fishing with somebody, I go, oh, I'm going to try that next time. Right. I'm even going to do it better. Cause I'm going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you gotta always be learning. Yeah. And, um, I ended up, I got a few jobs up there and from bad luck, this happened on that boat and this happened on that boat, but I ended up fishing with Wink Dorsbacker who I don't say he taught me the most, right? I guess my dad taught me the fundamentals growing up and how to tie a knot and, and all that stuff. 1000% the, the go, go, go 100% I attribute to him mm -hmm. to this day. Like, and, and we left on kind of bad blood because like I couldn't take it anymore and I couldn't work, you know, for the guy, but I fished the whole season up there with him. We came back to Palm beach and then, and then I was done. But until you learn that and, and understand why you can't do this, you can't do this. Don't do that. Because whether you're sail fishing, whether you're bluefin tuna fishing, whether you're world record fishing, whether you're black marlin fishing on the reef, one little thing you didn't do right. And it cost you a world record or it caused you not to pull or it caused your line to break or whatever it is. So, um, you know, I fished with a lot of different people mm -hmm. and in, uh, in 1992, I bought my first boat. Nice. I bought my 25 Mako. Nice. And, um, and I mean, I'm sure your brother Cliff had to be a big influence throughout the whole, because you guys grew up fishing together too. Didn't yeah. You? He, he actually bought a 21 foot Mako mm -hmm. about a year, I think before I bought, that's where him and I started. He bought a 21. I bought a 25. He bought a 26. Right. I remember the day. <laughs> he bought a 33. It's funny. I got the loan at first year. I, I remember I'm the day. Cabin federal. I didn't even have a job. Yep. I remember the day. He got the loan. Really job. I was yeah. like, oh my God. That's funny. I remember, I remember that to, day. I went to the bank cause we knew the girl there and um, yeah. I was I like, man, I could, I could sell enough fish to pay for, it was a, like a $300 boat payment, yeah. you know, for a 25 make with a single motor, you know? What's that? What's that? When you, when you, you're past the time frame where you can't like, 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 Statue of limitations. He's like 22, <laughs> he's 22 years old <laughs> yeah. buying a 25 Mako, which was, I remember you calling me the day, like, I got the loan, I got the boat. I'm like, what are you going to name it? And you're like, I'm going to name it after my dad's boat. And that's yeah. when the vitamin C too. And then nice. I was like, that's where the two comes from. Well, so the my dad's boat up in New York was vitamin C. Mm -hmm. When we came down here, his boat, his first boat he bought here was vitamin C, Roman numeral two. Mm -hmm. Then his Mako was Roman numeral three when he passed away. Mm -hmm. So then Cliffy was the first one to buy a boat out of him and I. So he started with vitamin C, you know, kind of started over again, just vitamin C. Okay. So when I got my boat, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to beat this Roman numeral thing up. And I just went vitamin C T O O. T O O. Okay. Yeah, nice. <clears throat> all right, cool. That's cool. That, yeah, so that's good. That's where that all that. started. But, and then, and then, and you know, we've had, I mean, you know, the stories and tournaments. And so this is where this is the thing. So this is the humble thing that's coming out right now because Tim, you're a legend. Okay. So, and, and I'm, I'm glad you gave us that little backstory um, of, you know, your whole start to all this like that, because, and I don't ask everybody that, right. Like the, most of the time I'm just like, Hey, what's up? You know what I mean? We're yeah, doing, yeah. how'd you do in that tournament? How'd you do in that tournament? Right. But you know, you're a guy that I want the audience to really understand, you know, who, who's sitting in front of us, like from beginning to cradle to the grave here. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I th you are part of the group of guys that have brought, Pompano to the level of where I always say that the best fishermen come from Pompano because no matter where you go, wherever you are in the world, you're going to find someone from Pompano there. Right. Like whether you the Los Sueños tournaments or, you know, then Panama yeah. or, you know, all over the place. I Nova think Scotia. we touched on that at the Cove that night or yeah. at some point we did. And another one who's a legend down here, Casey Hunt. Yeah. A thousand percent. <clears throat> right. We all fished percent. together. It was all, yep. you know, and, um, and then I'll never and forget Chippy. it. His, his dad used to tell us all the time, if you can make it here, competitive fishing or charter fishing, you can do it anywhere on the planet. Yeah, yeah. I Stanley, just fished with him in Key West. And when we went to yeah. Venezuela and these guys are fishing 80 pound and hundred pound leaders, oh, you might hook a blue marlin. We're not blue marlin fishing. We're sail fishing mm -hmm. and white marlin fishing. 
and you're allowed to use a 30 foot leader. So you can catch a 300 pound blue marlin with a 30 foot leader. I don't care what, you know, and we went to 50 pound fluorocarbon down there. They thought we were out of our minds, you know, no snap swivels, just a, you know, ball, you know, you, and you know, you start winning and, and redefining the rules there, you mm-hmm. know? Um, so yeah, I mean, that well, was, that's, that's what I mean. It's like when I bring it up, you know what I mean? And, and I say that like, you know, your face comes into my head when I say that statement, you know what I mean? And, and a few other faces like the hunt families yeah, yeah. and, and, and the guys like that and already and, and yeah, yeah. skip and all those guys, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, that's like this whole like cloud of faces that I see when I say that, you know what I mean? And you're definitely right on the top of that cloud. So, I mean, you're a legend, you're a living legend um, and you're an innovator. And, um, and I want to make that clear to the audience listening. You know, to this. So I, that's really why I wanted to get that backstory. Um, so an interesting thing is that then you launch into doing tournaments, right? But I want to bring up one question because I was talking to Mike Lamb about this recently and, you know, he comes from Virginia originally mm-hmm. and, and the whole thing. So he's got this mid Atlantic experience and he's explaining to me about how those guys really don't like kite fishermen. Right. So you are heavy Marlin fishermen, like throughout all the islands and everything like that. Can you give me a little insight on that and what's your take on it? Yeah, you mean as far as kite fishing goes? No, or? just opinion. The opinion about it, yeah, like why I mean, the kite, rift. Kite fishing is such a it's such an art, you know. Like I, I mean, as far as I, I've kite fished a lot. I, I'm not on the level of these guys, you know, or mm-hmm. the South Florida, you know, Art Saps or those guys. But I've learned from those guys. Like I, I mean, the first person I ever knew who really knew how to kite fish was him, and uh, you know, like preparation was everything. That's what I learned from him. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, like I went to his house one day and I saw like a thousand salmon hook rigs hanging in his in his room he had a string of mono and i'm like man that's a lot of rigs it's like yeah it's like half a season you know so pretty you know mm-hmm. preparation meets opportunity type thing but right yeah but kite fishing i mean you know obviously it started with in catalina island you know and then bob lewis brought it here and then these guys of uh, you know south florida charter fishermen kind of adopted it from him because he was crushing it, beating everybody you know mm-hmm. but when it comes to the terminal tackle rigging this is again why he was such a pioneer in it. Like he came up with things that nobody else is doing. I think he's probably the first person I ever saw with popping corks, like fishing popping corks. And I mean, stuff going back that fundamental that you take for granted today, but like instead of streamers versus popping corks, mm-hmm. you know, or kingfish eating everybody off, he was catching all his fish because corks were staying up on top. And, you know, just like the salmon hook, the salmon hook had been around for a long time, but going to like the stainless ones. And then, you know, he definitely, uh, change the game i mean mm-hmm. he not only that but when it came to boats you know the, the the kite fishing thing and i'm not even sure he realized this but i worked on the big boats back Thank in you. the 90s fishing like the fort lauderdale billfish tournament i'll take another one thanks the fort lauderdale billfish tournament um kite fishing with larry withall and i had to fish against him and cliffy mm-hmm. and what we realized was where all the big boats had flown kites in the 80s and 90s like Timmy and Cliffy were doing it on center consoles and just whipping everybody's ass to a point where the big boats got to a point where they thought they couldn't compete with him or Cliffy or who else was in frack. Frickin frack. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, Casey, yeah. it was, it was yeah. a big Those thing. Those guys because... were dominating it in the nineties, like mm-hmm. dominating the tournament to where they were putting observers on the boat. And here's a great story. <laughs> he got, he had just gotten his comp 27, right? <clears throat> mm-hmm. And like, it was the sickest boat. Like it was gunboat gray before any other boat was gunboat gray. I'm like, man, that's a killer color. You couldn't see it. It was invisible. Like in any haze, you didn't know where he was, you know? And uh, I remember Skip Smith putting like a 60 year old observer on his boat. I don't remember what year this was, but sometime in the mid nineties or somewhere around early that 90s. early nineties. And uh, he puts this, this old man on the boat and Timmy goes to him. He's like, dude, you're making me late. This guy, there's no way this guy is going to survive the run I'm about to make. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, you got to have observers. Cause he had won like three or four in a row. And uh, he's like, that's what I got. You're going with it. And I remember you warned it. Like Timmy warned, warned. What, what circuit is this? This was the Fort Lauderdale billfish tournament. Okay. I want to say when the guy broke his leg. Yeah. That was Miami. Was it Miami? Yeah. But you came into Fort Lauderdale. I'm trying to, that was a remember. different one. That was a, that was a tournament. Yeah. I'm, I don't remember the details. They took his observer off the boat on a stretcher. Mm-hmm. I was Jeez. there for that. Like ambulance waiting. Like that's how hard. And that was in the inlet. That was like, Thank you. we never even made it in the ocean. <laughs> it, it, for the fact that it was, it was really rough in the ocean. Right. 
And when the Bimini started, you know, 1098, everybody takes off. I turned around and went in the cut and I was going to run the bay down south, mm-hmm. you know, where it was calm. And it was a freighter coming out the inlet. And I, you know, I had a T top on the boat then and I hit, you know, the, fr- the freighter wake landed nice and soft, you know, couldn't have been any more perfect. Right. But this guy was, you know, holding on for dear life. He hit his head on the T top and fell down and his leg folded over in three different directions. No. Really? Three minutes after he, I was unloading him on the floating dock at Miami Beach Marina. I'm like, what do you guys want me to do now? They're like, go fishing. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah, had fishing, to. but yeah. Hardcore, man. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That, 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 that could but ran hard. All of that being said, right. So you say you look, you know, like where did it start? How did it start? So when I met Tiny in the Keys, his lifelong dream was I want to be, I want to, I want to meet on a charter boat. You know, I want to go mm-hmm. catch a sailfish in Hills, bro. I, I like, I, I, I hear him talking about it in his little blue Azuzu when we're riding down to the keys <laughs> to go fishing and, uh, or snook fishing or whatever we were, you know, and, and, and just doing our, our stuff. And, and then when I quit working on the boat, we kind of lost contact a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then there was no more tiny, like, you know, like a long time had gone by maybe right. years and, you know, no contact, don't know where he went, don't really know what he's doing. And then somehow he came back and we started talking again. And, you know, I worked on this boat, we're pitch beating 500 pound blue Marl, And then we caught this world record, you know, like he left and came back a master and I'm going, Holy shit, this guy, you know, how, yeah. you know, like he wanted to do what I'm doing and now I want to do what he's, you know what I yeah, mean? So it's yeah. like, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's just, and he worked with some good people and he had the dire passion for it, which is where it all starts. Right. You know, you say, when did the fire start? When did it, you know, that's it. It's, you gotta want to be the best at it. I don't care what you're doing. You know, if you're not, if you, if you don't want to be that guy, if you don't want to win every tournament, if you don't want to catch every world record, if you don't want to catch a bigger fish than you know, then that's cool. But, you're never going to, you never you're never going to be, you know, you're never going to be at the top, you know, right. if you don't have that dire passion to do it. And, um, so yeah, I mean, that's I you know, we, we met here. I was kind of already doing this, even though I look at pictures now, I started to say that earlier. Like I would look at pictures with my dad's boat and go, God, how did we ever catch a fish? <laughs> we didn't have bait wells. They didn't have bait wells. They made, you had a bait well this big on the Mako. You could put like three dozen baits in there Mm -hmm. and then you would fill the fish boxes up with water and throw Mm -hmm. some bait in there. And they're sloshing, you know, four foot long fish boxes. Back then you just made do. There was no. You did whatever you did, styrofoam coolers or whatever it was. It didn't matter. It was. uh, And then when I bought my boat from Real Music, Kevin McDaniels, Mm -hmm. and he had a 50 gallon plumbed on the deck and he would 300 pilchards every morning. You get up and go catch them, throw your four or five dozen goggle eyes in with your pilchards. Mm hmm. But that was like the beginning of it for me. When I bought my boat from Kevin, who had won the Pompano Rodeo a bunch of times, and like back then you didn't catch tunas, but this guy caught him every time I went fishing. Mm -hmm. Like to catch a blackfin tuna in the early 90s was, it was a big thing. Not like, oh, if we don't catch four, if we don't wait four in the tournament, you don't stand a chance. Like Mm -hmm. it was not like that. Whether they weren't here or whether it's not because of live chumming, because you're not allowed to do that anymore, Mm -hmm. right? And there's more caught now than ever. Maybe it's the tackle technique, whatever it might be. But back then, if you weighed in one or two tunas, you were God, you know? So I think a lot of that talks to, too, about, you know, what you said earlier about, you know, every time you go out, you're still learning, but it's almost like now the secrets are all out there. You know what I mean? And everyone's kind of just racing against the same methods and techniques, you know, and then who's going to land on it. Now there's also your separator guys, right? The guys that are on your level that are going to always know, yeah, I taught you everything I know, but I didn't tell you or right, everything, you know, right. but I didn't t- teach you everything that I know, Right, you know, that kind of theory. Yeah. But there's a lot of that. We were bait fishing yesterday on my brother's boat in Jupiter, sardine fishing. And my son was on Nate's boat. Mm-hmm. We we're sardine fishing side by side and they kicked our asses. Yeah. Well, and you my know, buddy's on my boat, John Hubart, and he's going, is this when the teacher or the master I got, it on, I got it on record from when he came on. So, so you, know, yeah. the, he, I mean, you know, there's a claim that was he, made there. There, there is a, um, and I, and I, you mentioned it earlier with putting a price on your time and mm-hmm. shutting down on the weekends and you're at your situation and my situation and right. So everybody's got their story. And, um, I remember my dad's friends 
when we started fishing the way we were and you didn't have, nobody owned a bait pen. Mm-hmm. You didn't know there was no such thing as a container. Yeah, right. Like that, that was my buddy worked at Fort Lauderdale. We were like, Oh my God, we could put these things in the canal and, and drill holes in them and put bait in them. And we won't have to sit at the buoy all, you know, like that didn't exist. So all the little things, like you say, you, that you take for granted now mm-hmm. that everybody's got it, you know, um, but I remember my dad's friends who were all phenomenal fishermen back in the day going, you know, and if I had to, I would say they were probably 50, 55 years old and, you know, we're, we're growing up Mm -hmm. and I'm like, why don't you guys fish anymore? You know, you were the people that we looked up to back then. And and they were like, that's why, because you got 12 containers in the water with 3000 baits penned up and we know we don't stand a chance. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, We can't do it anymore. Um, and, and now I see that happening you know, I took up hunting, you Mm -hmm. know, that's a whole nother passion. That's, you know, um, and, and, you know, tiny said it, you got to put a, you know, you got to have a price on your time. Right. And the tournament thing for me anymore, like the sailfish tournaments, it's awesome. You know, when I see Artie win three in a row, does it get me like, Oh, I want to be back. You know what I mean? Of course it does. I still, that was a hell of a season. Every time I get a sailfish bite, I get excited. You know, Mm -hmm. last year we caught 65 in one day, the most we've ever caught. I mean, like it's, I can't wait. I hope they start tailing down there, you know, this month. Yep. Um, but it's like, so let other people pause for a second, pause for a second. Cause I want to bring that up. Okay. Because the first time you did it, you did what? 50. In 2009. Right, in 2009, and that's the state record. Was. Right, was the state record. Yep. Then that got broken, and then you went down and broke it again. Uh, several other people broke it in between all that. Right. So I caught 50. The next year, Jimmy Lambert caught 58 okay. with Fly and Joe. And then uh, Main Attraction, um, the Silent Hunter guys, the, a bunch mm-hmm. of Keys guys mm-hmm. in the last few years – they caught like 60, 65, 67, 70. Okay. So it, it, you know, they, those guys wrapped it up for, for, for a while. So, so do you think there's another run in there for you? Um, I hope so. I mean, yeah. it was epic, you know, just watch, you know, when it's like that, I mean, the blue fins are coming through, there's yellow fins coming through, right. there's yeah. great white sharks swimming around, there's swordfish, there's blue marlin, when there's sail. I mean, it's, the ocean is just alive. So to, to get the opportunity especially driving the boat from up top mm-hmm. to be able to cast to a hundred sailfish in a day. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's, and throw it a couple of tunas. It's a majestic day. It's just special. You so, know? and Alan was on the boat with you. He was on the, boat. on the 65, right? Was he on the boat with 65? I think he's, yeah. I think, well, I'm pretty sure it was the 65. So just, yeah, he was just on to the, bring that around the guy that you dyed the mustache yeah. last the, week. was The, on the first boat day that we went down there, we did two trips. Mm-hmm. So the, the 65 was the second weekend or whatever. We went down there the first week we were there. Um, you know, to me, with the we learned the day that we caught 50 mm-hmm. back in 2009. When you're sight casting, you don't want to hook four or five fish. Mm-hmm. It's You could catch one or two of them way quicker. They're not going anywhere. Right. right? So, okay, you got a visual. Let's catch these two real quick. Then we can go cast to those. So kind of two at the most, Mm -hmm. unless, okay, here comes five. Everybody just goof off for a minute. You know, it's just your releases are five seconds, two seconds, Mm -hmm. eight seconds, 10 seconds. I mean, it's, it takes you longer to tie a hook than it does to get another fish on. Right. Um, And we learned that not by mistake, but the day we caught 50, we were like, okay, no more. Well, we were only down to three spinners anyway, so we couldn't cast any more than that. We broke one and we only had three spinners left, but Alan on that, First day that we fished, we caught 32, I think. Mm -hmm. And the kid's a ninja. Yeah. I was running the boat. I'd get my eyes on him. He'd hook a bait, run to the bow, jump up on the cap, look at me to get the visual on the fish. And I'd be pointing, pointing, pointing. Okay, I got him. Don't cash yet. Wait till I tell you. He, he caught 28 out of the 32 fish. Wow. I never caught 28 sailfish in a day. Wow. I mean, that's, you know, that's stellar for the kids. Right. So, right. Um, I like Alan a lot. He's awesome. He's a good he's kid, awesome. man. It, it was special to go down there and do that and, and just to see, you know, see that many fish and, and be able to do it, you know, mm-hmm. you know, there was a boat caught 76 the day we caught 65. Really? S- Scott Martin did that bass guy. Wow. Roland Martin's son. Yeah, yeah. He's got a 42 Freeman. They caught 76 that day. 
Wow. So is that the holding record right now? Yep. Yep. Man. And he was That's pretty he was, amazing. He was, that is amazing. He was like 20. When we were at like 30, he was at like 55 for the day. I'm going, there's no way we're getting to 40. I went two one hour periods without catching one for whatever reason. Just really bad luck. Couldn't get a beat on. Uh, yeah. Missed a couple. I went two one hour periods without catching one. And everybody was kind of resetting and kind of mm-hmm. driving through the same area. At the end of the day, it was just him and I kind of, let's right. just keep going with it. And it was, I was talking to Timmy on the phone. I'm like, oh shit, I gotta go, I gotta go. There's a, I never hung up the phone. I put my phone in my pocket. I thought I hung up on him. And we caught uh, eight fish in 12 minutes, mm-hmm. or something like that. And he was listening to the whole thing. He never hung up the phone. Oh, really? Yeah, he was him and Tyler <laughs> cool. were listening to it in my pocket. Oh my god, that's funny. <laughs> but we were we were neck and neck, but and they ended up so we ended up with sixty five. We, right. we, we we were catching them. We ran out of daylight. Wow. But, um yeah, it's it's just it's it's special to go. I mean, that was you know, it's to see that many fish and dude, that's awesome. It's it's awesome. Do you think do you think it's I mean, do you think it's strange to catch that many fish in one day? So <laughs> here's the thing. It took till 2009, right? Right, for anybody to catch 50, right? It was yeah, the first time right. ever done in the United States. You know, in in Florida, yeah. obviously you don't catch sailfish, right? You know, so why, why hundreds of years mm-hmm. before somebody does it? Yeah, yeah, this is changing and that's changing, and you know we're doing different things, and I think like any other sport, the level of you know the 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 caliber of the angler or the the baseball guy or the basketball, you know, it's just getting better and bigger and harder. Um, and I think it's the same thing with fishing, you know, the, no, the, the, yeah. the level of the, you know, of the anglers and captains right now. So, you know what else is strange? What's that? Our strange questions that we have. <laughs> oh, our Papa's peel our strange <laughs> questions. Said the word. That was my, that was my segue into our strange questions. Sponsored by Papa's Pilar Rum, who remind you never to be a spectator. So what we have every episode are these strange questions that people who you may or may not know will write me and ask a question for me to ask you guys on the air here. And um, we'll have to pick a winner for a free T-shirt. So it's that's all the glory they get if, if their question gets chosen. So... Since we have Carlene in here today, I would like for Carlene to read the questions. If you will. The country. Yeah. Um, What's going on, baby? So if you don't mind, would would that be good? Yeah. All right. Would you like me to tell you who it's from? Yeah, you can say this question comes from whoever. And and by the way, sorry about the phone ringing, so I forgot to turn it down. That's okay. It's all good. That was also strange. (laughs) From, From Mr. Jim Rubeck for Tiny. What is the weirdest thing you've pulled alongside a pier or a bridge so you can feed kudas a three-eyed shrimp? Oh, oh I know. I got that oh, answer. Oh, man, I got it. <laughs> man, we never, nobody, <laughs> socks. White rags. Tube, tube, White tube, towels. Tube, tube socks. socks. Let me tell you, man, in summertime, that was, that's so that funny. we oh decimated the barracuda population around Anglin's Pier. That's you all would, I you would drag a shirt, and when all the kudas start following, mm-hmm. you'd have two guys with snag hooks snagging them. Really? You got to, but wait, you got to explain to it more like this. These things would never, rarely would you use, lose a sock. I've seen maybe two socks lost the whole time right. or a rag. You drag the old fish rags that had all the blood and guts all over them. You didn't need the set. Anything light colored, right. you would drag it down the side of the pier and one guy would have it on their rod and there'd be 10 guys behind them snagging kudas. Because yeah. the kudas come up in, out of curiosity and yeah. just, they're looking at it. They don't know if it's another kuda or something mm-hmm. they can eat. Yeah, that was. Uh, you ever use those old tube lures? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They never worked much back yeah. then. I, I mean, I when we used to go down to Marathon every every summer, we had this place that we would go down and I just feel like spend like two weeks. Down they there, sold it's a, a ton. different it deal. They it's sold it's a ton of them down car. there. Yeah. Yeah. We used yeah. to buy them at Captain Hooks there, yeah. Lock a Cut. Yeah. Right, and we used to just those things worked like a charm, and then we we take them out to Sombrero Light. We if we'd see a cooter there and just want to hook up with them, they they hit them like candy. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah the, 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 they work good in the keys. We would only pull the rags out when you got to remember, like in all the different stalls under the pier, you'd have all the cooters just lined up. Yeah, and I mean you're fishing them all day long, trying to get yeah. a bite out of them with every live beat you yeah. got. Sometimes and, they'll yeah. just stare at you like. 
And eventually, yeah. you know, you wouldn't you that look you like that back then, like, oh my God, you caught a 30 pound coot off the pier. You were king, you yeah. know, because yeah. you couldn't get a bite. You couldn't get a bite. You couldn't. All right. There's no one around here because you weren't allowed to use snack hooks on the pier. Mm-hmm. So let's drag the rag. No one's looking, you know. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. Good. Three, we, we three 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 I mean, I can't tell you other things we snagged off that pier. We're not going to say that on camera because <laughs> there is no statute of limitations on that. But I mean, I can tell you this. Yeah. I Moving watched on a, to Tim. No, go ahead. Sorry. I, watched, I, I just want to say this. I watched a banner plane almost go down one time off of Anglin's Pier with a guy named Stephen Rains on a shark rod. Almost crashed one of the old banner planes because he had actually snagged it with a kite on his shark rod. Come on. Not kidding you. There's people who can attest to this. They were on Anglin's Pier that day. Literally almost stalled out one of the old Wankel banner planes. No. Literally like it was in trouble. He had snagged a banner and it was... How those things trouble. even stay up in the air, I'll never know. They're going yeah. like two miles like an two hour. Like two miles an hour, oh, yeah. 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 But yeah. Tim, from Jim 2, what do you do when you have a bunch of venison, some old fence panels, and a spool Wahoo, le- Wahoo leader cable? Oh, God. Start a bonfire in the backyard, and when we're playing cornhole, we got a big fire in between the boards, and we were trying to cook venison one night, so I had to spool a cable. Mm-hmm. For Wahoo lures, I'm like, watch this. We've been drinking. Watch this. We've been drinking, so we're <laughs> not really thinking correctly. <laughs> like all the good things happen after sure. watch this. Yeah. So I, this is after I took my outrigger, my PVC outrigger holders, and I put cable across them to try and right do it like they used to do it in the woods. Well, both of the outrigger things melted. The five gallon buckets melted, and that, that went bye bye. But we still had the stake on the cable, so I'm like, oh, we'll just stretch out further. So you stood over there, we stood over here, and just kind of swung them around, swung them around, slid them off the cable, and really, oh, it was awesome. It's awesome. It's an innovator, I'm telling you, innovator, <laughs> innovator, innovator, man. Hey, yeah. so uh, I got What do you love, hunting or fishing more? It's not like that. I love them. Not both. like that. Yeah, no. it's it's. Uh, if you had to choose one, it's a different breed. I, Where's your head at with that? Yeah. I don't know. I can't answer that. Your son showed us a video mm-hmm. of his leg. Oh, the shake. God. Shaking. From the deer? Yeah. Okay, so, you know, how many inches is the deer? How many pounds is the marlin, right? Yeah. So a lot of people, I got customers all over from the Midwest talking about deer, and they want to come gator hunting. So they're like, you know, I sent them a picture of 11-foot gator. They're like, is that like a 140-inch deer, or is that like a 190-inch deer? They don't know. Right. Right? So... I do the same thing with, you know, like a deer compared to Timmy Swordfish, mm-hmm. you know. That's like, a beast. We'll get to that in a minute. So though. it's like how many days, how many rods, how many baits have hit the bottom in South Florida, mm-hmm. how many buoys are out every night, and it's the biggest one ever killed. Right. right? So how do you compare that to a deer, to, you know? Right. How many 150 inch and 160 inch deer are killed every year in the Midwest? You know, how many 190s? Now you're getting into a different world. You get to 200 inch deer, it's, you know, yeah. free range, you know, not a high fence deal. Right. It, it, it could never happen, but how many people are ever going to get a shot at a 700 pound swordfish? You, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, you know, so Timmy and I were talking about it, and I'm like, so that we, you know, we lost a big one when he was little. Right. Yeah, he said, smoke the one that they killed. And, and Scott also saw it getting weighed. It was on the boat. And he's like, man, that fish that we lost was way over a thousand pounds. Really? And I never called it a thousand. And I've seen several thousand pound fish weighed black marlin, blue marlin. Right. You know, where, you know, a lot of people don't get to see those fish. So when they say I lost a 500 pound swordfish, you've never seen a 500 pound fish. So. Like it could have been 300 pounds if you mm-hmm. lost them 30 feet down. You know what I mean? Like I've seen a lot of, you know, big fish weed. And when we lost, it was in 2008 when I lost that fish in October and um, had a harpoon in it, saw the fish for 40 minutes and whatever, pulled the hook out of it, pulled the dart out of it, pulled the hook on him and, and he died. I mean, the thing was dumping blood out of his gills from the harpoon, but um So, you know, Timmy's like to kill the swordfish that they did or to catch the one that we lost that day with, you know, and I only bow hunt. Right. Right. So I don't like kill one deer with a gun and it just doesn't do it for me. So how big of a deer would it have to be to, 
you know, versus that swordfish? I, I don't know. It's right. it, I think I think that answers the question though. They're both um again to me they're it's, different. It's not they're, all they're about complete, the kill. Right. Right. It's the, it's the and, and and I hate the cold. I hate the dark. For me to get up at three o'clock in the morning, take a shower, because you gotta do all the scent stuff, and know that I have to go sit in a tree stand like this for twelve hours in twenty degrees, it's it it's the biggest mental like I gotta you know, you don't have to psych yourself into going fishing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right, right. I have to, oh my God, he might walk out today. And I want to do it with my bow. You know, when you get a deer that big that's been around for six years and been shot at 20 times and you know, they're smart. It's hard to kill them. You know, um, they don't get that big by being dumb and to get them within 20 yards and kill them with an arrow. It's, it's just a, so comparing it to fishing, there's only one fish ever two fish and that swordfish. I don't know that I was shaken. I don't know that I was shaken when we lost that big one. Cause mm -hmm. I don't think we had, we were just trying to stay in the game and let's figure out a plan and how we're going to kill this thing. Yeah. You're probably thinking on your techniques too much anyway to really, you know what I mean? Let it, let it, let the shaking get to you. you know, Cause so, there's that isolation period with when you're hunting, you know what I mean? Of, you know, but when you're actually catching the fish, you, you got too much going on yeah. to really probably let it set in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th there was only one fish ever that made me do what a deer does. And that was a 12 or 1300 pound black marlin I missed on the gaff in Australia <sighs> that Cliffy caught. That was the only fish that I was petrified to swing at him. Well, listen, I personally really don't care if you told me which one you like more than the other. I just loved hearing what you just said. Yeah. So let's put it it's up. Put it to, to, put it to that. That's why I asked you the question. It, it, I just wanted to hear you talk about it. Uh, it's hard to... So we're, we're in the middle of our questions still. So Next one from Chris Sanchez. It's for both Tim and Tiny. Who had the best wild goat ride from the years in the hooker <laughs> in Ghana? <laughs> Tiny wasn't there for that. Yeah, I was. Were you? Absolutely. Uh, Two years on the hooker in Ghana. Are you going to explain I, this to me? Because I, I, didn't, that I wasn't was there when you were there. was from Facebook, yeah. and I didn't know what he's no, talking I, about. I wasn't, I just with, threw you. It out I wasn't there. with you. I wasn't with you. got some good questions. Thoughts that yeah. just went through my head. I got a different goat story. Go. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> We're getting them. You sure you sure you don't want any rum? No. So you don't want rum. Well, actually, you sure you don't want any rum yet? I'm gonna say. So I guess it's. All right. He doesn't want any rum yet. No, no rum. So it's. Uh, <laughs> we were sitting at the hooker house. They they rented a house in in Ghana on the on the river. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they called it the hooker house, the hooker logo, and all that stuff. That's where the boat stayed. And we were sitting there eating dinner, and. Uh, I don't know how it got brought up. I, I don't, I don't know how it got brought up. But someone's like the, the, the end of it was the, the little local kids are going to take a van and go get a goat and I got to wrestle it. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're carrying on and we're hanging out and shit, here comes these kids holding this white goat. Like you're kidding me. Yeah. Like little horns. And, don't mean you must be. <clears throat> and I'm like, Jody, seriously? Like, I, I you know, I, I got to wrestle a goat, but now I have to. So I did. I, I got oh, him. I got him in a headlock and I went down and I got him like laying on me with his feet and you know, his legs up. And I'm like, now what do I do? Like I'm, I'm stuck. And then of course I was the bad guy because I was, you know, wrestling the goat. Man, and you're just tenderizing that goat for Ghana. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you're, I, I got a Ghana goat story. Can I answer that? Yeah. yeah. So, so it's no, it was for both of you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the night we killed a grander, it was 1,030 pounds. It was with mm -hmm. Bo Jennings and, um, and uh, Clay Hensley on the on same boat, same house. Um, the celebrations were getting out of control, right? Because that was like, I've waited my whole life for that. Everybody was partying. It was the first grander killed in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, you know, at whatever, West African record or whatever. And, and uh, it was a big deal. It was like, it was a tough kill. It was a tough, tough what fish. What right? on? Uh, on the hooker, on the hooker, same, same on boat the hooker. that he was okay. fishing on. So same trip, S no, S same boat, different, no. Trip. different season, different okay. season. Right. Was, Timmy was talking about the season before. This was the season after. This okay, two thousand and three. So you were there in two thousand and two, I think, right? Yeah. I went two years. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so you were skip on that? No, with no, this Clay, is, Clay Hensley with Clay, yeah, right. Clay and Bo Jennings. Oh, right? oh okay, Clay gotcha. and Bo. Right. So so we we killed a grander and uh, Frank Kokolegbo, who's an African mate, who's an amazing guy. Um, so we kill it and we're celebrating. We're having a good time. Uh, uh, Jay Meyer, 
was on the, it was Jay Meyer's trip. And uh, so we we're just out of control. All the Africans cut it up. Nothing went to waste. Everything was getting eaten. And that night, a guy, a little African guy that worked with us, his name was Eddie, cornered me up in the kitchen. He's like, hey, listen, I don't remember a lot of this conversation, but he said, hey, listen, you know, the guys worked really hard and, you know, we want to have a celebration. Um, we want to, we want to buy some goats. So I'm like, whatever, man, get some goats, you know? So next day, <laughs> yeah, man, let's get some goats. I, don't, I don't quite remember this business deal Dude, going down. Everybody. I don't remember this business deal going down, but Bo Jennings can, can, can verify this, that, that the next day Eddie shows up. He's like, Hey, tiny, I got your goats. I'm like, got my goats. What are you talking about? I'm hung over as hell. Right. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, he's got two little baby black goats. Right. I'm like, they're, I mean, these things are like this and he's just, he's looking at him and he's smiling. He's like, yeah, they're going to have big chop. Chop means like food, yeah. dinner, right? Party. So I'm like, nah, Eddie, man, like how much are the goats? I think they're like 20 bucks a piece or something, whatever. I think I, I think he made a commission on it. So I paid for the goats and I'm like, you know what, Eddie, you kind of took advantage of me when I was partying last night. You know, we're not eating those goats just yet. And I was leaving like, you know, relatively soon after that to, to come back to fish some tournaments. And uh, we kept the goats as pets for like for like a couple of weeks until I left. And here's the best part. So every morning, Bo would get up and he'd come out of his room and he'd be like rubbing his eyes. He's Australian. He'd be like, oh, I'm like, Tiny, what's going on? He's like, oh, those effing goats, mate. They kept me up all night. You, you got to let me eat these goats, man. You know, I'm, like, I'm like, oh, man. He's like, they're outside my window. And like, and all my life. I can't take it anymore. I mean, Bo was coming apart at the scenes about these goats, right? And I know he's cracking up watching this. And uh, so anyway, so, so I'm like, no, man, we're like, you wait till I leave. I'm not, I don't want, I ate enough goat in Jamaica as a kid. I'm not eating any goat, right? Like right. give it to him when I leave. So I'm not kidding you. I leave, I leave in the taxi. I, I, I'm, I'm literally like get home and I get this email from Bo. He's like, mate, <laughs> your goats are bleeding before the taxi even turned the corner. <laughs> he said they had a nice memorial for you for the goats. Like they literally cut the goats right there. So was, like, they could not wait for me to leave. Right. Cause like, oh my God. I was just messing with them. You know, every day I'd come out there at noon, there'd be like nine hours. Africans looking at the goat, like licking their Sound lips, like, like they're just ready, you know, <laughs> and uh, that's some good Ghana goat story for Oh you. my God, that's awesome. <laughs> All right, next so one. Why would, you, hold, why would Chris Sanchez know that? I have no idea I how have Chris, no idea. Say, Chris Sanchez knows everything, like his father, yeah. Carlos, like okay. they know everything. <laughs> All right, yeah, I was just curious. I was just curious. Chris why? you? No. That's, uh -uh. that's the thing. That's why I was curious. I'm like, yeah. why does he know that? Because you just told me two individual stories. So, yeah, right. two different stories. I'm sorry, no Carly, idea. and I cut you off. Goats are a thing in Ghana, for sure. Yeah. I see that. <laughs> Danielle Maddock. Oh, God. Uh oh. Mm. Tim, who's your favorite cast net thrower? <laughs> it's going over your head. Better say her. All right. So, <laughs> well, you were cast netting <laughs> yesterday, so maybe. When I talked to Danielle this morning, mm -hmm. who she didn't tell me her plans for. Mm -hmm her cross track, but she did tell me that you guys were hanging. Oh, now it makes sense to me. What? You probably don't remember much from last night. No, I do. So but she says you guys were all laughing about how, when they were little kids, who you would have contests on who could throw the cast net for this with her and Maureen. Oh, uh, I don't know. I remember, I, I remember, <laughs> I, you, know, I, remember I cast that in all of them in the pool one time and they almost all drowned. <laughs> I was like, look, I got them all. And they'd be, be like swimming and then they were all gasping for air. Like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what she meant. John all right. Lowe's. All right. Oh, Lowe's. Lowe's Lowe's sorry, butchering the last name. Can you tell a story of a swordfish caught off a commercial pier? This is for both of you. And then second part to that is which, well, we'll go with that one. Can you tell a story of the swordfish caught off commercial pier? There's no name for that. V Vince so. Austin. Vince Austin. Vince Austin caught a swordfish on a Spanish mackerel sidewinder jig on eight pound test off Anglin's pier. I was there. I watched it. Fish was probably 90 or a hundred pounds. And it was in, it was in the surf eating Spanish mackerel. It was a good Spanish mackerel run. We're fishing for him. Mm -hmm. The thing was just bloated out. Like it was full of Spanish mackerel. And he actually caught it on like eight pound tests on a macro rod, on a spinning rod. He had the head out of the water. Like we were running for the gaff and the net and whatever we could get. And he actually caught it. The thing just swam right to the pier and stuck its head out of the water. It was like done. Really? Yeah. Like 10 feet of water. Did he land it? And we never killed it. No, never he killed it. Yeah. He actually, he actually never, the, the, the jig was never in the fish's mouth. It was on the tip of his bill. Okay. When the fish turned his head straight up, it literally slid off after a few minutes. I think right. he had like a wrap around it and it came off and it was, it was a nice one. I mean, it's it kind of cool. Yeah. Some crazy stuff swam by that pier, man. All right. I just thought you were going to say he caught it on a sock. No. <laughs> no. No. 
Well, this one's it's for both of you gentlemen, but this one's going to be for Tiny first. Which method is better for getting results from a crew? <clears throat> Loud and vocal or calm and collected? I would love to hear Tiny's answer. <sighs> Um, I never yelled, man. I, I never <laughs> yelled, but I was always very stern. <laughs> and and before headsets, are like there's no need to yell. Like honestly, mm -hmm. I've only had one captain. <laughs> you're looking at me. <laughs> you were, after your fourth kite going in the water. I was probably yelling. Yes. Oh shit, buddy. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 I see. But here's the. I, I would have to say calm and serious. Like especially with headsets these days. Mm -hmm. There's no. Back in the day, you're yelling because you you know you, you, nobody can hear you, or you're in the tower. What the or whatever. fuck are you doing down there, man? What the fuck? Oh my god! Here she goes. <laughs> Listen, she you told, gave her the business. She got the business one day when I was like, "You need to stop acting like no. you're better than you are." And be so what was she like, doing? She's fishing with me. I she know, was actually I know. She was the second mate on a boat actually at one time. All right. Yeah, and we went kite fishing. And I'm like, you know how to kite fish? She's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no. He kidding. had me wrapped up because I was so worried about the this, this school that I went through the night before about Tiny getting me on the dock and what I had to have and not do and everything like that. And mm -hmm. I already was kite fish, and that's why I was put in the position to where I was to work second mate with him. Okay. So obviously, it was – I didn't just make sandwiches, you know, but All it right. was a good sandwich, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then – um, but, yeah, so when you're down there, after you get schooled from Tiny the night before and you're down there running the thing, you get all fumbled because then you're worried about, am I doing it right? Am I not doing it right? Is Tiny going to – you know? So mm -hmm. I yeah, slipped up a little bit. Hey, but I, I, listen, I, I stood. I, just like everything, I evolved in, with the, the understanding and the teaching, especially these days with mm -hmm. younger people because – they're not from the school we came from where we got yelled at and screamed at and like got told like don't do that again or you're going on going home you know these days it, it, it's definitely you have to manage people crew and crew is the most difficult part of sport fishing on a private level your crew getting a good crew is the is very difficult meaning it's a, i shouldn't say it's difficult it's just hard there's a lot of training and I kind of, over the years of getting frustrated, <clears throat> diverting from Carlene, <laughs> but she was great. Now, Carlene's awesome. Let me, let me just say this. Let me, let me get back there. I don't want to Carlene divert. is awesome. Let me tell you about Carlene. Carlene's, Carlene the is. The only, only um, bartender we've had on twice. That's awesome. And she should be, like, she needs a full-time job. Because when it comes to fishing and the experience of fishing. <laughs> the, I'm looking for work. I have, okay, go ahead. The, the love and the passion for fishing right here, like. She, there's no doubt that's a fisherman, like mm -hmm. no doubt about it. That's not a poser. And, you know, I used to, I used to give her a hard time about like not being that back in the day when she really wasn't. When you look at all the Instagram heroes that are out there today, that's a fisherman, right? That, she's in a room full of fishermen right now. Like she's one of them. So I give her all the credit in the world. She has a passion and a love for it. And she's seen some catches and been a part of catches from thousand pounders in Canada to 1200 pounders in Bermuda to to giant blue marlin i mean she's mm -hmm. she's done it you know she's seen it she right. has she has more nerve than a lot of people out there yeah that's the real it. reason why i want her to be the bartender yeah, on the it's show pretty authentic. it's not just because she's hot pretty authentic but, yeah. yeah no she's Appreciate cool it. yeah yeah well that's what that's what the, one of the questions was last week right was why how, the, how'd the you hot, get such a hot bartender well, that was why i had rubber gloves on and he was a hot bartender so yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for, for you to put up a kite from behind the bar. <laughs> I, I, you, you keep looking over his shoulder at me like something's all oh, nothing but love, baby. Nothing but love. love. I'm scooting nice. in closer and closer. He's getting a little behind me. What do you think on the matter? <sighs> I don't know. I, I, I've been on a lot of different boats, and you see whether it's running them, fishing on them, you know, angling, whatever, and Water. everybody's got their own deal. Okay. Thanks. Um, my thing, and I – am extremely vocal um but it's it's out of the passion for it right mm -hmm. i think there's a disrespectful vocal where your people are now they get scared they're nervous and they're saying screw you and there's man he's doing it because he wants us to be the best and yeah. feel it and and push us so and i and i I think water. that's where I was yeah, more floor, than quiet and more fridge. than offensive. I was just, you know, we can't do this. You can't have a snap so low, but guys, yeah, I'm screaming because we just lost a $50,000 right. fish. Right. You know, I'm glad you made that <clears throat> distinction though, because there is a difference between an asshole and just yelling out of passion. Right. And, and I think there's all of the above. I think there's yeah. quiet captains 
Um, somebody I know that fished with me for some time, fished with Ray, I think last year, Ray Rocher. Mm -hmm. He goes, he's just as cool, as calm as can be. And yeah. And Artie's like that too, where know, he's just like, you know, um, I can't, I don't, when I get like that, I won't do it anymore. Right. You know right. what I mean? I'm, yeah. I want to scream and yell, I'm not wearing a headset or I'm going to blow your eardrums out. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, no, so you, you can't, you can't scream and yell. There's no need for it. And I think, I think the headsets make a huge difference for me in, in the communication, right? The communication. Cause I remember I got to a point when I had a lot of captains that talked to me and when I felt I was over talking in the cockpit, the, the, the key thing is if you're trying to teach somebody, Mm -hmm. it, 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 there's Thank a lot you. of communication that has to happen. So I think the headsets make a huge but difference in it. There's communicating. Hey, yeah. slide it out a little yeah. further, reel it in a little bit, check your bait. Exactly. Right? There's a lot of that, that you might not be able to do 35 feet up in a tower, you know, on a, on a 20 knot wind. Yeah. But none of that's changing when you get a bite. Right. Yeah. I, I think so. There's the communication. Yeah. Hey, yeah. right. Make everything go smoother. But then when it comes together and holy shit, we got a triple on. All that goes out the window and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Yeah. So this is the part of the show where I, Please, I always make the comparison thanks. with fishing and art, right? Cause I like, I probably do this practically every episode, right? Cause I always believe there are huge parallels uh -huh. of the two. And this is why I love fishing so much. Why it's, it's, I was so passionate about it is because as an artist, I see a lot of these parallels, right? So there's uh, different ways to look at art. Like if you look at my art and you look at Liz's art on the wall, Com two completely right. different spectrums right. of, of how to approach things, right? But you're you're getting the same result when it comes to passion, right? And and, and saying yes, that's art, or yes, that's fishing, right? You know, where right. one guy can be cool, calm, and collected, and just say that's the way I'm managing my anglers and my and I've done all my prep work, my I have already had all my conversations with them ahead of time, you know what I mean? Or you know, no, I feel the need to art direct this in. You know what I mean? And, 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 and really just make sure that we don't miss that, you know, in my way. Right. Right. And there's, and art is created the same way. You're going to have one guy that's going to approach the creation level that way. That way. And you're going to have one guy that's going to create, do the creation level that way. So this, that's my art and fishing parallel for today. So I get it. I get awesome. it. Awesome. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, you know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot, lot, of, there. lot of good fishermen. You got different, you know, D yeah, different, different structure, different, different folks, right? Different deals. Who's my your winner? on sound. What's that? <laughs> As I said, an apocalypse now. Or my Who's your winner? Sound? I'm going to go with Chris Sanchez. I think Chris had the, uh, he Man, nailed I'd it have there. to say, yeah, I'd have to say Sanchez. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, we'll do a consolation. I don't prize. know how he knew that. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know. I, he pulled one. He That's pulled a goat, goat out of his hat. He, he, some, <laughs> goat. Yeah. he spent some time with Bo. Yeah, probably Bo and Jody, maybe. Yeah, yeah. that might have been it. That might have been yeah, it. Maybe. So, all right, I'm going to give a consolation t-shirt to Danielle as a going away Perfect. present. So, all right, those are our Papa's Pilar Strange Questions. I think we had some good ones today. Yeah. Um, so, we're going to get back to something that I want you guys, I want you both to talk about. First, I want to get your opinion on the matter. Right. Because we had him in here to tell his own rendition of the story, him and his buddies. Right? It was buddy and his girlfriend. Right. But your son owns the Florida state record for swordfish. Right. 767. Mm -hmm. Right. And my first inclination as a father, when I saw the pictures on Facebook and the, the internet exploded that day, was to think of you. That was my first inclination, not even to think of him and, and everything. It was to think of you, <clears throat> right, as a dad. Right? And <clears throat> you had to have just been tickled pink with the whole event of this, just knowing who you are and how you grew up and how your family, son of a son of a sailor here. Right, right. right? And um, when I explained it to Timmy on the show, was, you know, yeah, you guys are young to have caught this fish because there are guys out there fishing a lifetime to catch the fish of a lifetime. And you guys did it so young. But when they brought it up on the dock, no one was surprised it was them. Right. And there's a lot to that statement, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. And a lot of that has to do with you. I know it for a fact. Right. I'm not even speculating. Um. And, but I want to hear what your thoughts are on the matter. And I want to hear both your thoughts on the matter. 
because I mean, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on a matter as a connoisseur of the game. Right. Yeah. And, and just, you know, what, what you feel and having the intimate knowledge of the family and everything like that. But I just, well, the thing about he, he, hasn't, he hasn't talked about, it. we talked about a lot of sailfish tournaments, a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. but what people don't probably don't even really know this. A lot of people don't know this, which I'm fortunate enough to know. He was one in, in 99, 2000. He was one of the pioneers of nighttime sword fishing, him and Eric Leach mm-hmm. and Chris Zedar. And those guys, these guys were going out at night and putting up numbers that he had a fence with how many, I don't know. He had, he had a picket fence of swordfish bills in his backyard going all the way around his house. Like he, and I knew this halfway around the world. Like I, I was like keeping track of how many, like they were catching. I'm like, man, this is crazy. Like this is, this is before the day timing thing. Mm-hmm. Now everybody's a sword fisherman, right? This was when there was maybe a handful of guys, Casey Hunt, um, freaking frack. Frick and frack and Timmy, and Eric and I went with Eric. Actually, when I came back from traveling with Eric, I came back and like we fished the way he fished and Eric and, and Tim fished. But he they were crushing so many nighttime swordfish that uh, here's a question for you. How much of that bled over into the knowledge of the daytiming thing? Because he was, you know, he was definitely one of the pioneers of South Florida nighttime mm-hmm. sword fishing. Uh, we were talking about that last night, too, when Chippy came over. Chippy and I went one night, we caught 13 and missed. We never put a rod down. We were like stand up fishing with 80s. Wow. We killed 13, just the two of us. And um, swordfish, you know, that's like, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it, you know, the, the only thing with the, with the day timing, there was a big void between when we were going to Venezuela, you know, when mm-hmm. all that stuff was going on. And, and we were catching them there in the daytime. Mickey Mouse way, like tying oh, pantyhose yeah, with boxes of rocks, and <laughs> you got to break the line. I mean, just half-ass at best. Like, I feel if you ever went there and did it the right way, you God knows how many you would catch. But we should have started it here way sooner. Mm-hmm. We should have took what we were learning from Venezuela and started here, but we were like, man, it was. there's no current there. There's way too much current here. You'll never be able to do it. Hence why you got to leave your lead on. Right. Right. If that makes any right. sense. Yeah. Um, so it would have been cool to, you know, be the inventor of that here, you know, and, and, and been doing it before anybody else. But um, I don't know, you know, night timing was, uh, you know, I mean, you can go out and catch swordfish on rod and reel. You know, how many fish can we hook out here that pull drag on an 80? Mm-hmm. Right. You're not catching tunas, really. You're not catching marlin. So outside, no, it's, of, it's, outside yeah. of shark fishing, it's definitely our local beast, right? So for sure, could, when yeah. it was the only, a lot of it was yeah. the only fish that you could, yeah. I mean, you could, would you, you could, ever put a harness on? You here could for? pull marlin fish out here, and you could do okay, and they're out there. Yeah, you know what I mean. Right. But it's like to target them like you do in the Bahamas. I mean, it's, right. is it worth it? Right. You and, know what I mean. But you're right. So, so the, so the, the swordfish is our local beast. Yeah. yeah. And you're catching a lot of them back then before the buoy permits and before, yeah. you know, that's when after they shut down long liners, like there was, like, again, there was a handful of boats that kept it real quiet for a long time. You know, you well, were, we were doing it. The long yeah. liners were still here. Yeah. That's well, how yeah, they oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You had to dodge them when you yeah. were putting your rods mm-hmm. out. So the question really was about your son. What's your thought? Too? Tell me your thoughts. Like, I want to understand. I want to know how you felt, basically, for the, rather than skate around and ask you some pretty ass question. Yeah, yeah. How the frick I, did you feel when your son brought that fish up? So I was hunting with a friend of mine. I was like right. five hours from Pompano. So clearly I wasn't getting back. Mm-hmm. And I had half hour service at best yeah. on the property I was on. So I, he called me, called me, called me, called me. And after like five or six calls of getting connected and then disconnected. I, I got, he's on his way in with a good one. Right. I didn't know if that was 300 or 500. Is that Lance calling you? No, Timmy. Timmy's calling you. You know, right. as he's getting closer and closer okay. to, to coming in. And I found one spot where I, my phone finally connected and, and I was getting, you know, full service or half service. And I got like 20 text messages. Timmy's coming in with a giant, holy or like from other people. Cause I, I guess they were all calling people and, mm-hmm. and I got all these text messages. So finally I get to me on the phone and he's like, dad, I got a, uh, what was 106 inch short length or 110 inch short. I'm going, Holy shit. Right. Right. It's the real deal. And he's like, it's got like an 80, 90 inch girth. 
And I'm like, okay, well, you know, it's, you, you know, you, you're going to be right there with Stanzik. I mean, I right, don't know right. what the rest of the fish looks like, you know, but with what you're saying, it's a friggin' giant. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I, I couldn't move. I sat there the whole time in that spot because I didn't want to, you know, like I wanted to go home so bad. But I think you talked about it with those guys seeing the video when they started jacking that fish up Mm -hmm. and all the kids and all the people that were on the dock, you know, and listen to, Oh shit, six, six fifty, six ninety, seven, eight. 7, 8, you know, it went up to like, I think like eight fifty or something at one point before it spilled a bunch of water out of it, you know? Um, and then when it settled in, it's a 767 pound swordfish. You just caught the biggest one out of, how many swordfish have been killed here in the last 10 years right, of all the buoys and all Bowie the nights and all, the, all yeah. the nights and all the days. I mean, I don't know what that I'm sure already can tell you in five minutes sitting on the board, but it's gotta be thousands and thousands and thousands. Yeah. You just caught the biggest one. So as much as I wanted to be there or would have loved to have been there, I think they, he was better off without me. You take it. You know what I mean? You did it. You know, like I feel mm-hmm. like, and we talked about it a little bit. Um, they deserve the credit. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. You know, like you did it. And and I just think that it was awesome for them to, you know, to, to be able to get that credit, you know, the, the um, you know, to come in with a 767 pound swordfish and get to enjoy what comes with it when they talk about, Oh my God, Facebook won't stop and all the, you know, publicity and phones ringing and people sending them stuff and, you know, world record. And, you know, it's, um, I mean, it's, you know, it's awesome. I mean, there's, it's, and as a father, yeah, it's just like, you know, cause of course I was getting the the spillovers from that. Hey man, congratulations on this. And you know, Mm -hmm. so it's, um, you know, it's a great feeling. I mean, it's. You know what I told him? I said, you know, you know, not only is it cool that, you know, with the, the cause him being a legacy fisherman, like I call him a legacy fisherman of Pompano. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, he brought that fish back to Pompano. And that's what I see too. Yeah. Yeah. What we talked about before about, you know, us being the Mecca. Right of all creation or whatever you right. want to call right. it. Yeah, you, yeah, know yeah. I mean? you know what I mean? He brought that fish back to Pompano. Right. Your son did that. Right. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. That is pretty cool. You guys are pretty tight, right? No, we don't you hang out t- a lot, but we're I know, good friends. We talked yeah. about the whole, you know, and that's how friends go. Yeah. Good you know friends. What I mean? you, know, you, you fall in and out, out you know what I mean? And everything like that. But you know, you guys are like, you know, we could sit here now today and you could talk, you could just pick up right where you left off, you know, and then that's what good friends do. That's it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and you guys have, you know, bonds that have brought you together um, over time. You know what I mean? Goats. Whether it's fishing or whether it's, you know what I mean? Goats. And Goats. <laughs> whatever Goat the hell. Um, <laughs> it's really fishing. I mean. You also both have stared death in a vase and lived to tell the tale. Um, do you feel that these are things that, that maybe there's something else to that between you two, too? I mean, is there something like, is that something you've ever consciously thought of? I guess is probably the better question to where like, you know, and I see this. I don't know if you guys, you guys might not see this, right? But I see two guys who are dedicated to their craft, masters of their craft, right? For sure. Certainly. That I share a lot of common bonds and, and you guys also share that bond. Um. And it's a unique feeling, I'm sure. I can't say it because I never have stared at that. You know what I mean? But you both have. Um, And, you know, I think it's an interesting thing to have you both here in the same room, given all the parallels to that, right? And, you know, we talked about before the show, um, you know, is there anything off limits? And I I, want to kind of stress that before before I ask that question. Um, You know, if you don't have to answer, if you don't want to. For sure. And if I'm at a turn, I'm at a turn. But I know this is a very serious thing. That's why yeah. that's why I say it like that. You know what I mean? Um, but are you guys able to share any thoughts on on that, you know, aspect of, of your relationship? Uh mine was after his, right? When, yeah. What year yeah. was your ninety five? Ninety five. So I was yeah. five years after him. Um or shit. Fifteen years after him. Sorry. 
right? 10. 10, 2010. Was, was it five? 2010. 2010, yeah, 15. 15, 15 years. years. So, you know, again, we weren't hanging out every day then, mm-hmm. you know, and whatever he was working on this boat. And that, well, I, you know, it was just one of them voids in our relationship, I guess, if you would, mm-hmm. whatever. And, and then, you know, the words out, you know, what had happened. And, you know, again, how does... Right. I mean, people charter your boat, hold you at gunpoint. Right. You shouldn't be here. I don't care what you did. Right. Yeah. I dodged a couple of bullets, but, you know, <laughs> and Timmy dodged something that people don't dodge. Like, yeah. you can't even see it coming, wow. you know. And I hope you share that. But, you know, what I'd like to say about it is I heard Tim's story. I was, I was sad and shocked, but I think I called you around that time too, um, a, a while after you had recovered and stuff. But, um, but the thing is, you know, what, what I've learned and, and I wasn't surprised that he survived what he survived because from the day I met him, I always knew he was a, from, I tell you stories about his knee. He's somebody who possesses grit, right? Grit. And that's something that I think is, is overlooked a lot. Um, in our business these days, I think in just in life, society, in life, yeah, in society. Listen, but- when I see Tim, you know what I see? I see like, like I look at him and I see like a guy from World War II. Yeah, he's a tough dude. You know man. what I mean? Like, tough like dude. one of those seasoned soldiers that have seen the shit, that have been through it all, that that just eats nails for breakfast. Like that, like like that's the kind of guy he is. You know what I mean? Like you know, and you, you drink black coffee because it, not because it tastes good, just because it makes me a bigger man. Or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that kind of like. You know, it's a gritty dude. Battleship man. Navy guy that's just been hardened by war. You know what I mean? And that's what that's what I see when I look in the eyes of Tim Maddox. Well, you got to be tough to go to sea. There's no doubt about it, right. no matter what. But what, you know. Well, I guess he, he represents like an attitude and a passion from an era long forgotten. That's cool. That, that, that I think so sure. today's society needs a little bit more of. Some toughness. He obviously taught it to his kid because right. his kid's out there doing a lot of pretty amazing stuff and killing big creatures, you know? Yeah. So I didn't, I cut you off there. You'd- no, no, I was just saying, you know, I wasn't surprised that he, he survived that situation because again, grit, he's a tough guy. I've seen him deal with things that other people would never yeah. deal with, you know? And, and I mean, he actually even taught me that when I was younger, you know, like I would always pick his brain about like, how do I get in the game? And he'd say, dude, you have to, you're a big guy, man. Like nobody's going to, he was honest with me. Mm-hmm. He was like, you're going to have to be faster than everybody. You're going to have to be smarter than everybody. You're going to have to work harder. Just, just right. the truth of it. I'm telling you, chances are you're probably not going to get your foot in the door. And that actually really was super inspirational to me. At least he told me what I had to do because mm-hmm. he had been there and done it, you know? And then to, again, to watch him go through some of the things that he's, he's been through, I mean, the dude and, 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 you know, how he runs a boat, how he, how he fished was so intense and hardcore. It's not surprising that the guy would come out of shaking hands with a grim reaper, you know? Right. And I don't know if the audience, I don't know if you're going to share any of how that happened or what happened, but I think it'd be interesting, <clears throat> interesting to share. I know he's humble when it comes to it, but it's an it's amazing. He doesn't want to. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, 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 um, you know, for me, um, yeah, you know, how I've, does that shape you moving forward? I I've, guess I've told a story a thousand times, obviously. Right. And, you know, and, um, so I never would be hunting if it wasn't for that. Mm-hmm. Right. I never hunted a day in my life before my accident. Um, not being able to walk for two or three months, you know, on the couch every day. The only thing that's on TV all day, every day is hunting shows. Mm-hmm. And I've had customers ask me in the Midwest, like for years, Hey, if you ever want to kill a deer, come and kill one. And after, you know, being on the couch, watching all these hunting shows, I'm like, man, if I can ever get off of this couch, I'm going to buy a bow and I'm going to kill a deer with it. And a month after I got off the couch, I killed a deer at my buddy's house in Texas with my bow and worst mistake I ever made. But, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, you talk about different things in life and right. How do you put a a price on your time? And, and, um, you know, for me, what happened to me and, and I look back on it every day. Um, you know, my son's got a friend in the hospital right now that, he got drugged the other night, swallowed his vomit. He's now he's poisoned in his lungs. Kid's 21 years old. Kid that was on the boat with him when they caught the swordfish, Jeremy. Really? <clears throat> so I was telling my wife yesterday, we went and shot our bows um, just at target practice. And 
the feeling that I remember being in the hospital or one of the millions of feelings, but like not knowing, not knowing what's going on, not remembering what you remember, not knowing your name. Like my kids are holding my hand. I don't know who they are. Um, it's a, it's a fucked up place. It's a, you don't want to be there. Right. And, and this kid, Jeremy's there right now, right? Mm -hmm. 21 years old. And they won't let no one in the hospital to see him except his mom. So I didn't like talking to his mom. And I was telling my wife yesterday and I'm like, man, I, I feel like, I feel like I can go there and, and I could wake him up. He's on a ventilator been for a week now. I'm like, I feel like I could, right. I've been there. I don't yeah. know. It's crazy. Yeah. Like I've never felt, I'm not this super spiritual guy, but like, we were just talking about this yesterday. Um, so, you know, going through what I went through and never supposed to make it through the night, never going to walk again, never going to eat again, never going to drink again, never going to go to the bathroom again by yourself. Um, every doctor from around the world go and no one's ever been exposed to that much carbon dioxide and, and live. No one's ever, there's never been a survivor. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, me, of course, being me, and I'm, fuck, I, I should have saved her. I should have saved the dog, you know, just because that's me. Um, but again, I was talking to my wife about it yesterday, and I'm like, you know, there's no, there's no, right, med medicine science, right? There's no science that I should be here. No whatsoever. None. Jay Meyer said, oh, shit, this level's up to that level. That level's here. His kidneys aren't right. working. I mean, not you're only, a living mirror. Not I mean, only is he going to die, right. but he's going to go through the worst pain he's ever experienced right. in the next 48 hours before he dies. Right? This yeah. is coming from brain surgeons and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, for me, it just, you know, and it took me a long you know, you say, have you retired yet? I, I say it jokingly. Um, my accident was in August, 2010. And I pretty much didn't work until three years ago from, mm -hmm. from 2010 and not by choice. Right. Right. So like I look at the first year and the second year and third year after my accident, I don't remember any of it. I don't remember any of it. Like there's a void in my life that I just don't remember. Um, and for whatever reason, um, you know, three years ago, my brother and I kind of worked a deal out at work and, um, you know, I don't know that it's better or worse or just learn to deal with it or, or whatever just happens in time happens mm -hmm. in time, but knock on wood, I'm, back to where I used to be at work and, and, um, you know, it's not easy because my brain doesn't work the way it used to work, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I think you just, and you, and you take, I say it was the most humbling experience of my life almost to a fault because it for years shut me down, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, I'm walking and, you know, for five, six years, I was going through all these lawsuits. Right. And, and, you know, forget about the lawsuit and the case and the, like, I can't do what I used to do. Right. You know, you can't put a price on that. And I'm not trying to, you know, um, and I don't, you guys can, and I would start cursing at both lawyers on both sides and start crying and leave the building and say, I'm done with it. It's mm -hmm. not worth it. Right. So, um, it's, it, it was just a, you know, extremely, extremely, extremely humbling experience that, you know, I'm glad I am where I am today and, and able to talk about it. And, um, you know, I can go back to work and, you know, um, I don't do a lot of things that I used to do. They say one of the biggest things right. from carbon monoxide, one of the biggest side effects is you lose interest in things that you used to do or relationships that you used to have, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, spot on, you know, I used to yeah. go free diving 10, 15 times a year in Bimini. I haven't been in the water five times since my accident, you know? So it's just weird. I used to love it. Mm -hmm. I don't do it anymore. You know? So there's a, it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of stuff like that. And, um, you know, business wise, it's like, you know, can I do it again? 
you know, right. will I be able to, you know, or is this, this is what I got. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you look at things a lot differently. You know, I do. I mean, I have to, you know, it was, it was too close. Do you find that, um, getting on the water helps or you know what I mean? Like, because I mean, given, given the things that we talked about earlier with your lineage and where you've come from and it's just being who you, you're Tim Matic, right. just being who you are. Right. How do you feel when you're on the water now? Like, and, and, and cause I know that's a huge part of your life. Right. Right. Like, yeah. you know, you really, really huge part of your Absolutely. life. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And, and to say that you're probably more comfortable on the water than on land might be fair. <laughs> right. Maybe, you know, so, I mean, do, do you, do you find that things are different out there now for you or do you, do you feel that there's an aspect to that that's somewhat um, helping in recovery of all things like that? I mean, the, 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 you know, the physical side, because my legs and my muscles and nerves and all that stuff. So that was really hard for a mm-hmm. long time. Um, you know, certainly not as easy getting up and down the, you know, the tower as it used to be. Um, there's many people that have reached out to me that say, you got to be in the sun for three hours a day. Cause you still have carbon monoxide in your system and don't let anybody tell you difference. Here's the science behind that. And is that like a mind fuck? I don't know. This is a guy that reached out to me that, yeah, you know, he's been studying it since before anybody knew what it was. And, and here's what his research, you know, has, has, has told him, uh, and I don't do it anymore, but there was a point in time when my fiance, who I'm with now, you know, our, our relationship was like this because again, my mind's all over the place. My brain's not working right. And, I don't do it anymore, but I remember a couple of years ago, like I would come home from work and I would just go sit out back, smoke a cigar and, and just kind of get the last couple hours of the, you know, Mm -hmm. and I do feel like it did a difference. Like I feel like it did something, you know, being on a boat, you're in the sun all day, obviously. Um, you know, if, if, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get back on the water after it happened, you know, like, um, you know, cause that is me. That was me. You know, that's me. Yeah. So I, I gotta, I gotta be out there, you know? Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah. I love being on the water again. If it's goggle eye fishing or sail fishing or, you know, I went bass fishing the other day off of 75, you know, I don't care, you know, just being on the waters, you know, it's what we do. It's what this, we grew up doing. This is connected by water, right? So this, this is kind of like, I always, I always get like, I always want to find out where one we have on the show. Like what does connected by water mean to you? Right. You know, it, because it's a broad term in my mind, if you really think about it, because it could be mean so many different things. Um, you know, but you know, the way we kind of look at it here is that, you know, it's not a fishing show. It's not necessarily a fishing business. I mean, it's just, we try to like look at the big, the big picture yeah. of, of it all and like what is connected by water and, and, um, yeah, and, and, bringing us together, you know, to kind of get beneath and, yeah. you know, fe- see where our roots are and, you know, how deep our mangroves punch into the sand a little bit. And, um, you know, that's kind of what I want to ask you too, like <clears throat> the, how much does that affect you? Cause I'm always kind of, I'm always looking to grasp it rope for, for more theories on the whole connected by water. Cause that's always my search, my philosophical search on it too. Well, you to, say you, you want know. to get the right people, right? So, yeah. you know, already skip, you know, Andy was, and Moisey was on it, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you can't get any more, right. You know what I mean? And whatever your story is or what tournament fishing or making lures or, you know, making sure I don't, it doesn't matter. Like it's in your blood. Right. And, and those are just a few of the guys that, you know, it's, it's what we do. That's it. It's what it's, we do. It's what we do. Yeah, if we're, I mean, we're able to make a living at it or do it, you know, whatever, then yeah. that's, that's, that's great. You know what I mean? But it's all about, that shared passion and but it, there's a reason that i mean you try to define passion right right and it's very tough to define that word right you know what i mean because it's like well okay it's passion but what what does that give back to you right and i might be stumbling over this one a little bit but like that's what it's about at the end of the day 
right? Like if you can kind of bring passion into every day, like some way, somehow, you know, like, like today is the day, right? Like if you can wake up every morning and say, no, today is the day I settle those debts. And today is the day that, you know, I, I capitalize and I just don't get by. Right. And today is the day, right. That, that I reach out to that person. That I've always, that I keep saying in my head, I got to call that person, you know, like today is the day where I finish that job. Right. And, and if you can say that every day, then you're going to live every day with passion, mm-hmm. you know, because you know, if you, it's a, the carpe diem kind of theory, you know, it's like t- if today is the day, like not tomorrow because tomorrow right. is waiting too long. You know? and, and you don't know if you're going to be there tomorrow. Yeah, right. yesterday, right. yesterday, 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 yesterday's, yesterday's gone. I thank God for it. You yeah, know, what yesterday's mean? gone. Not tomorrow. I don't. I don't think a, a day goes by as a fisherman, uh, any fisherman. At least that's why I, I think that you don't wake up and go, "Today's the day." You know, like you talk about getting out, of, getting into the tree stand at five o'clock in the morning. But when you're fishing for the fish of your dreams, yeah. same thing. Just right. like you're hunting for the deer of your dreams. Man, today's the day, and that motivates you, and that I think is where the passion. That's where you find out if you're passionate or not. You know. Yeah. And usually, you've stayed up all night thinking about that one, or <laughs> thinking about winning the tournament, or thinking about shooting that deer. Yeah. That's 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 where you know what passion is. The cool thing about all of us being connected by water. Number one, it builds amazing friendships. Right. Right. There's two guys sitting here that, you know, that that are witnesses to that, that are examples of that. But man, it's it's amazing. It's 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 such a cool thing where fishermen can, and I've always said this, the thing you're most passionate about and you love the most in life, you can do for a living. You can make a living of it, whether it's art, yeah, catching a fish, you know, or, you know, being a captain or whatever, you can make a living at the thing that you love to do the most in life. And I mm-hmm. think that is where people forget how lucky we all are. You know, the friendships are, are the bonus to that. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. Unlike and, other and, businesses. And, and the trick is to do it in a way where you don't become a slave to it. That's it. That's the trick. That's it. You got to love it. You yeah. got to love it. And if you lose love, love it. for it, if you yeah. lose love for it. That's why you got to keep that today is the day in right. your head. Today's the day. That's why, because that's what keeps your passion alive. Yeah. That's what keeps that passion, that drive, that from being just a job. Yeah. Right. If you can say, no, today is the day where my Sistine Chapel happens. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or today is the day that I at Your least talk to waiting. the talk to the to the people or the thing that I'm working on that make that Sistine Chapel happen. Like today's the day I drive that nail into the fucking board. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just like fishermen, your best artwork, I, t- I would take a bet with you, has not happened yet. No. It's I, like the best fish we've caught, ever caught, hasn't happened yet. I'm going to say that on my deathbed. I, I, don't, I don't think the best days of fishing I ever had have come yet. You know, yeah. I'm grateful for the ones I've had, and I'm sure you are too. Absolutely. But if you're not thinking like the best is yet to come, man, you better <clears throat> you better figure that out. So there's another art and fishing parallel. Mm-hmm. I'm never gonna stop being an artist. I'm gonna die an artist. Mm-hmm. Right. We're gonna die a fisherman. Right. Yeah. It's not what you do; it's who you are. Absolutely. Hundred percent. It's in your core. like you, you. Listen, you could retire from being and and. No offense to any accountants or lawyers out there, but, you know, you could stop doing that one day and just be done with it. Yeah. Right. But I grew up always knowing that I was, I had a gift to do this. You know what I mean? And, and in my whole life, I've just, I've never applied to any normal college, just applied to art schools. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, and no one ever had a problem with that. That's it, man. You know what I mean? It's because it's not what I do. It's what I am. You know what yeah. I mean? And I grew up a fisherman too. You know what I mean? And, and that's the thing. It's like, you're going to die that way. And, you, and once you accept that, and once you understand that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Then clear your freaking path. Make it happen. Mm-hmm. Don't expect for any anything else to come up and ride up your ass and say, hey, this is something different now. We're going this way. No. Mm-hmm. That ain't going to happen. Now you got to do what you love and you never want to do in your life. Right? <laughs> Good stuff. I'm so happy you guys came in today. Thank you for having us, man. I'm thank glad you, I got to see you. this guy. Thank yeah. you. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I you. can't thank you enough for that, Tim. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Pre- appreciate you opening up like that. No worries. Thank you for like documenting all the awesome people you have on your podcast. Like seriously, and getting to hear <laughs> stories, even though we're friends with a lot of them, you hear sides on your podcast that. To, to these people's lives that never knew existed. And I think that's just awesome. 
You get I mean, to hear their stories, you know? I mean, when you grow up in high school and you walk into a room and you see a big ass blue fin tail <laughs> on a wall, right? And then the guy walks into the room and then 30 years later, I can bring him back into this room and have a nice conversation with him about life and where we've been and what we did. It's pretty cool. It's cool stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Then really cool. Here we are. Cool that's, what, that's why I do it, man. It, it, it's really why I do it because like we, we grew up here, you know what I mean? And this is a special place, right? And that was a special time. And this is a special time too. Great things are happening now. Years from now, they're going to talk about your kid's swordfish, right? But yeah. we highlighted it when it happened, right? Right. But we're also talking about things that went back. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's it's like that's why I want to do it because I see what I grew up in in the little bubble that is Pompano that everyone makes fun of Pompton, right? Right. But it's a beautiful place, man. Filled with beautiful people that are tough as nails, yeah. right? But they got hearts of gold. They really do because we all share a passion. Yep. So, all right. I want to thank our sponsors today, right? So if you're in the market for a new truck, call Dean over at Joey Cardi Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. He will help you out and hook you up and get you into a brand new vehicle, right? Um, they got a lot of good deals going on. They always do. Um, Joey's another good friend of ours. We, we went to high school together and you know what I mean? And uh, he's just really a big, nice member of the community and does a lot of good things for a lot of people around here. So, you know, support that, please. Um, I want to uh, remind everyone to never be a spectator. As our friends at Papa's Pilar Rum always tell us, right? Um, we drank the sherry cask today. Good You stuff. drank the blonde. Oh, you drank I, I, the, no, yeah. I drank the sherry cask you, and the blonde. It was you really started good. with the sherry. Yeah, I call them really sherry good. Cokes. Really good, man. But yeah, so... Um, Unique yeah. flavor. So um, th this really is, the, you know, the one of my greatest things I love about being associated with the Pilar family is just not just the product, but the people. I mean, they're, they're just a great, great group of guys. I mean, the people that run this organization, they're top notch. I mean, they're all, they're all big time anglers and, you know, Tropic Star and you know, big fish kind of company. And, and you know, they, they really bring forth the Hemingway. It's way, awesome to keep it Hemingway know? alive, yeah. man. Yeah, awesome. exactly. For sure. So we appreciate that. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Maui Jim, our good friends at Olakai. And also, if you're hungry, I really suggest that everybody in this room go to Papa's Raw Bar and order something from the Connected by Water Sushi menu because that is a beautiful menu full of the best sushi in all of South Florida. Um, and also... Head over to Pop Amigos if you're hungry for lunch one day. They got the food truck over there in the Bailey Arts District. And also, they just announced that they're opening up a new Coconut Creek location. So, they're going to have two locations, right? which um, which we're very, very proud of. So, um, also, I want to remind everyone that we did design the entire line of CV apparel. So, if you guys want to go over there and enjoy some of the DFRAIL collection, go over to shop.cvboats.com um, and check it out. We just launched our new women's line which it came out and um so hopefully you guys get the chance to check that out and enjoy it so uh, do you guys have any parting gifts and words before we sign off no nope. thanks carlene thanks for making you, tiny some... love you too thanks for making good cocktails <laughs> i love you tiny. carlene throwing me under the bus yep. thank you so much <laughs> anytime thanks so for having me. he wanted you in a bikini so yeah, don't maybe, tell, maybe don't next time maybe we'll next time. Out next time so sorry <laughs> married woman there <laughs> i'm old and over 40 now trouble. all good fun all, all good, good fun all good fun all good sorry time I'm just, all good. Sorry, I didn't mention that. So, all right, cool. Listen, your ego is not your amigo, right? Always do your best. And in the end, just let God do the rest, right? And do not ever forget. Never forget this. And no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, we are always connected by water. Thank you, gentlemen. Absolutely. Thank you. Good shit. Good job, man. Nice. Good.